Welcome back to the Fight of Faith series, First and Second Timothy. Uh, we are continuing. I hope that you've been enjoying our series uh, and study in these books of the Bible. Uh, I've been enjoying it. I've been learning a lot. And as the saying goes, I hope what feeds me feeds you. Amen. Amen. Uh, there's a lot of deep waters that we're walking into in this series. Uh, because the Bible is relevant. You don't have to make the Bible relevant. It just is relevant to what's being discussed in the church in 2019, what's being discussed in the culture. The Bible is super relevant to what we're, what we're going through as a people, and there's always things that are happening in the culture. The Bible's countercultural most of the time, and uh, has solutions for us, and healing for us, and restoration. If we understand the Bible well, we can see freedom, and we can see the flourishing of our families, of our lives, of our cities, through following the Word of God. It's amazing. And so we are going to jump into 1 Timothy 5 in just a moment, and we're going to talk about honor code. We're going to talk about having a code of honor as the family of God. As Christians, we're called to walk in a code of honor in different areas of, of life. Now, the church, as we see as Paul writes to Timothy and instructs him uh, according to what God is, is saying, is the church is a family of families. We are a family organization. We are supposed to be healthy families, learning together, growing together, walking together, so that we, uh, we have, from our individual families, we come together as, as a larger family, as the family of God, honoring one another, that we're diverse in backgrounds, we're diverse in age, we're diverse in economic level, right? We're, we, but we come together as one, we come together as a family. And whenever we talk about the church being a family of families, you know, my dad usually inserts his favorite song right about here, we are family, and then he kind of like, he adds, he adds brothers and sings it a little different, and so I know sometimes we're like, how does, how does the next part go? I don't know the next part, but, we'll, but we have a lot of fun, don't we, uh, around here. And uh, it's good because we should have fun as a family and uh, have some corny times that are just good memories, right? Every family needs some of those. <laughs> well, I'm going to keep moving here. <laughs> But in what we're going to see in 1 Timothy 5 is that Paul speaks to Timothy about the household code of the culture. In the Roman culture, there was kind of a code for how a house is operated. And so he speaks to three different areas of how to establish a code of honor in these different kind of relationships. And so we're going to talk about three areas today. We're going to talk about honor for generations and family. We're going to talk about honor for leaders in the church. And we're going to talk about honor for, now watch my facial expression and listen to my tone of voice, honor for slave masters. Right? So we're going to talk about honor for generations, honor for leaders, and honor for slave masters. Right? Uh, there's kind of that question mark exclamation at the end of that last word there because we're going to see what Paul has to say here and understand the implications for us uh, today. So 1 Timothy chapter 5, we'll read it and we'll pray and jump into this message. So Paul writes to Timothy, and we're going to go into the first verses of chapter 6 as well. But here we are in chapter 5, verse 1. Do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters with all purity. Honor widows who are really widows. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. Now she who is really a widow and left alone trusts in God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. And these things command that they may be blameless. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Do not let a widow under 60 years old be taken into the number, and not unless she has been the wife of one man. Well reported for good works. If she has brought up children, if she has lodged strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has relieved the afflicted, if she has diligently followed every good work. 
but refuse the younger widows. For when they have begun to grow wanton against Christ, they desire to marry, having condemnation because they have cast off their first faith. And besides, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, not only idle, but also gossips and busybodies, saying things which they ought not. Therefore, I desire that the younger widows marry, bear children, manage the house, give no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some have already turned aside after Satan. If any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them, and do not let the church be burdened, that it may relieve those who are really widows. Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the rest also may fear. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. Do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and for your frequent infirmities. Some men's sins are clearly evident preceding them to judgment, but those of some follow later. Likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident, and those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. Let as many bondservants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and in his doctrine may not be blasphemed. And those who have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather serve them because those who are benefited are believers and beloved. Teach and exhort these things. Father God, we just want to thank you so much for your goodness. We ask, Lord, that you would just uh, pour out your spirit on us today. We ask for fresh anointing upon me as I preach the word. Lord, as we talk about culturally sensitive issues, as we talk about uh, challenging things for us, Lord God, that we would be a people that establish a code of honor in our lives, Lord, and that we build churches of honor, Lord, from different races, from different economic backgrounds, male, female, young and old, Lord, we would... We would love one another, Lord God, and we thank you that heaven is not some monolithic place of the human race. It's every culture, every race, every tribe, every tongue, all unified, all equal in, in light of eternity, celebrating who Christ is in our uniqueness and our differences, Lord, and we thank you for that. And I just pray that you would teach us what you need us to learn today and show us how we can make a difference in establishing codes of honor, Lord God, in our homes, in our church, amongst leaders, and amongst uh, races and different classes or groups of people in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, honor code. And like my dad's friend used to say uh, that was a preacher, I'm an equal opportunity offender. So by the end, I'll probably offend everybody uh, at least once or twice, but you're not alone, okay? Because everybody's in the same boat today. Uh, and so we need to put on our big boys and girls uh, pants today and say, hey, you know what? I've got some things to learn. Uh, and uh, hopefully we all keep up the posture of learning about different issues and different topics. And I know as I've studied for this sermon and things that I uh, plan to continue to study and learn in, um, there's a lot more I have to learn. And I hope that we can handle these issues uh, sensitively. You see, the we have a thing in our culture, a misunderstanding of separation between church and state. And unfortunately, the state, and uh, I mean no disrespect to anybody who works in a government job, uh, but unfortunately, whenever the state or the government picks up an issue, Christians think that because of separation of church and state, like all of a sudden they can't talk about that issue anymore. So I hate that because then it, things get politicized and polarized and we can't get, have a good conversation about how to actually bring healing to families, healing to cities, healings to communities because, oh, that other party takes up that issue or the, my party takes up that issue. And we start fighting over things that every party and everybody should be willing to have a discussion about and dialogue about and try to come up with solutions that actually help us move forward. And so... I'm going to say some stuff today that probably offends right and left, that probably offends some of our understanding, depending on how woke we are or how well-read we are or uh, how well-versed we are in the culture. But we tend to gravitate towards voices that give us a very uh, 
tainted perspective of how to look at every single issue. And I don't think any one position, any one camp, any one policy, any one political party has the monopoly on truth or that they're the ones that have do everything right in God's eyes. And so it's painful for us sometimes to look at things through God's perspective because there is one polarized way that's always right and true, if you will, and that's the kingdom of heaven. His kingdom reigns over all. His name reigns over all. His ways are righteous and true. It's just that when they get filtered down to us, we tend to gravitate towards certain areas that we like better than others uh, or that benefit us more personally. And then we don't tend to look holistically at things the way God uh, instructs us to look at them. And I don't believe God made a mistake in his law. I don't believe God made a mistake in his word to instruct us how we, how we should live in ways that would bring him glory and would bring the flourishing uh, to the human race. So having said that, let's jump into honor code, all right? So honor code, the first place Paul's telling Timothy to establish honor is amongst the generations. If we're a family, then there's different generations, and he's, there's four uh, people here, he says, specifically to honor. This is how you're going to treat older men and younger men. And then this is how you're going to treat older women and younger women. And he says, first of all, treat older men as fathers. Encourage them as fathers. Don't rebuke them harshly. Don't correct someone older than you in a negative spirit. And I think in this generation, we have adopted that mindset that when people get to a certain age, they're really of no value to us culturally, and that's really, really sad uh, to me that we're uh, talking about euthanizing senior citizens. It's evil. We're talking about uh, uh, dis disregard for the aged, and the Bible says that having a crown of gray hair is, is come on, it's, it's favor. It's, it's got, you got splendor when you get some grays, and I do have a little bit of uh, grays right around here. You can't usually tell when, when I get a haircut, my wife uh, cuts my hair, and she does a good job, I think, but... Um, you know, you don't see them quite as much. They get a little more hidden when they're cut. But I got a few up there, right? But when somebody, but we're to look at those that are older than us and we're to show a respect and an honor to them, yes, just because they're older than us. Yes, that's right, because they have more experience. They've been through more. It doesn't mean that someone's older than you, that they always know more than you, or that they're, everything they say is always true. But there's to be a respect for people. We, and we don't want to lose that in the church. We don't want to lose that, that we regard the aged, that we, uh, that we celebrate people, and that we realize that when people get older, they actually have more and more to give the older they get. And that's the biblical picture that we get. The American mindset is that you're only good till about 65. Then you get a few years to kind of play with some toys. And then we're going to take a bunch of your money and taxes when you die. And, you know, hopefully that happens too soon, hoping soon, soon enough so that we get more money out of you before you go. Right? Like, that's really twisted because... The Bible gives us a picture that man, God said man can live about 120 years. And hopefully uh, more people are going to start having a vision of living a long, healthy life. And so when they get to 60, they'll realize, I'm just middle-aged. I'm just getting warmed up. I'm just getting, uh, now I really have some value to bring to the world now that I'm 60. Or, you know, maybe you're a little older even. And we celebrate you. We, and we say, go start a new business. Go do something to help the church. Spread the gospel. If you have extra time, use it to serve people. This is the picture that we're getting of those that are getting up there in years in 1 Timothy 5 is you've got something valuable to give. I thought a few of you might say, amen, that's right, I'm going to change the world. The older I get, I'm nobody done with me, put me in a home. That's right, I'm <laughs> moving forward. And then secondly, he says, I say your older men, younger men, treat them as brothers. We're to have each other's back. We're to look after each other. Treat older women as moms. Treat younger women as sisters in all purity. See, we're to be distinctive. What does the world say? Use somebody before they use you. Lust after them. Have sex with them. Have, an ex have a romantic experience with them. And the Bible's giving us a code of honor that could actually help us in life, could help us save the rape crisis, you know, solve the rape crisis on college campuses. What if people started treating people as family? You don't take somebody out, get them drunk, and then use them in the back room if they're your family. You're not, families aren't supposed to do that. 
Now, there's some brokenness in families, too, that don't follow God's ways, right? But we're to be a family of families. And we might argue with each other and fight sometimes, but nobody says that about my brother. Nobody says that about my mama or about my sister. That's right. I'll fight with my mom. I'll fight with my sister and my brother, but I will. nobody else is allowed to. Right? There's a sense of family that we're in this together. We've got each other's back. And there's supposed to be a code of honor in the church where young and old flourish together. Where you don't have to be an old church. You don't have to be a young church. You don't have to disregard anybody. We have to honor each other and run together after the things of God and champion each other. Man, we should, young people will change the world. Hitler, what did he do when he started to to want to change Germany and make it a, 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 this mission to annihilate Jews? He didn't, he went after the young because he knew they were moldable. He started Hitler Youth, right? And, and so what is he, he discipled the young. We gotta, we gotta grab young people, treat the younger as brothers and sisters and say, we need you here. We've got a place for you here. I wanna see the young people step up and serve and lead and join ministry and help us reach this city and help us reach our campuses. You can do something great in your years as a youth. And you can do something great in your years as you're aged and you get up there, uh, advanced beyond the average, right? You've got something even more to give in those stages of life. And we need people using their gifts and their callings to advance the church. The church is not a place where you come where the pastors do all the work. The church is a family where every generation, where all of us got work and got an assignment to do for the sake of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. So let's run together. Come on, let's honor each other. In our relationships, don't treat people as objects, right? Being irritated by them. Oh, these old people, they're always telling me. Don't be, he says, don't rebuke them harshly. Regard them. Don't despise young people. We learned that last week in 1 Timothy 4. And again in 1 Timothy 5, honor. Treat, treat each other like family, right? Don't be lusting after nobody. We got, our world is so twisted. Cougars and all this garbage of like, Everybody's looked at as like a sexual object. And that's what pornography, that's what a lot of mass media has tried to disciple us to look at people as an object to use for your own selfish means, to use them for sexual gratification. The Bible says treat each other in an honorable way like family. Have each other's best interest in mind before your own. Next, under this kind of understanding of generations, He starts getting specific about this is how you're going to treat widows. And he gives us very specific instructions on how to treat and care for widows as the church. First of all, he says, make sure that the widows you're going to help are really widows. And he he, he starts to explain what he means by that. And then next he says, family first. If children and grandchildren can take care of them, then they should pay back their own mom and dad. To help them. And all the parents that are like, amen. You hear that, kids? <laughs> you just took so much for granted till you got married and had your own kids. And then you're just like, thank you. You did this? How many sleepless nights, you know, as irritated as I can be being interrupted. And I think, man, I remember what a pill I was at night. And how I would not stay in my bed. And I would knock on my parents' door umpteen t- million times. <laughs> you know, and I'm just like, man, they did that for me? And they still love me? Wow. I can love these kids, you know. <laughs> I can love these kids. Right, start, he, he starts instructing family first. And we start seeing a biblical principle. You see, besides God's authority, which is perfect and it's a loving authority, it's a good example of authority, there are three other realms, if you will, of authority that God instituted into the earth. And the first one was family. When he made Adam and Eve and told them to be fruitful and multiply, he created the institution of family. And family is one area of his authority. The other area he created of authority was government, was government ruler. He got, the Bible says God appoints governing authorities for our good and for our safety. And the third one is the church. God delegated his authority to the church. These are the three institutions that God has delegated authority to bring uh, order and peace and blessing into the earth. Now, all three of these areas of authority can be misused and abused. Family authority can be misused and abused. Church authority can be misused and abused. And government authority can be misused and abused. But when it's done right... It brings peace and health and flourishing to to mankind, to our homes and to our cities. And so any kind of policies or plans that disrupt the family, 
that break up family or try to replace the order that a family's supposed to have bring compounding problems and pain to the culture. We've had policies in our society that have empowered families to not come together because we would pay somebody more money to ha live with her baby daddy and make have more babies but not get married right because you'll get more government assistance if you stay unmarried now that's a policy that starts to break up family when government overreaches the family when church overreaches into a family now churches need to disciple people on families sometimes they need to bring loving discipline into a family but a church paul's saying here it is not right for the church to do a work that the family is supposed to do because there's different areas of authority that God has given each of these. And when they support each other, that's good. But when they cross and try to control each other, that's broken. And it creates problems and unnecessary pain for us. So he says, family first. A family should take care of a real widow first. That is godly and it's wonderful in God's sight. And then he starts to define, who are the real widows that you're supposed to help? So he starts differentiating, like, because in the world, we say charity is just keep giving to people and make them dependent. But we're going to look at biblically today in, in a couple of different areas. Biblical charity was to help empower people who were already busy doing work or was to help them get to a place where they could do work. You know, a lot of the taking care of the poor, taking care of the broken in the Bible was about giving people a hand up and empowering them to live a better life. It wasn't about just giving people stuff for the rest of their life so they were dependent on you. It was helping people through times and seasons till they could become independent and they could become a benefactor or a blessing to other people in their lives. So real widows, who are the real widows? Well, he gives us quite a list. He says they put their hope in God. They continue night and day in prayer. Come on, they're powerful prayer warriors. They, do, they don't give this, themselves to sensual pleasures. They should be over 60 years old. They should have been faithful to the, her own husband. She should be well known for her good deeds. She raised her children well. She shows hospitality. She washes the feet of the saints. She helps the troubled, and she does all kind of good deeds. Come on, this is a powerful woman. This is a woman impacting her city for Christ. This is a woman that's impacting her church, praying night and day, taking taking care of her own family, bringing in strangers, serving people in the community. If we get widows that are like 1 Timothy 5, come on, we're going to take this city for Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, some of you widows and some of you that are getting aged, when Paul says adorn yourselves, women, with good works, he's not talking about limiting you. He's saying you can do frontline evangelistic city-shaking ministry by using your gifts to get out of the four walls and benefit your community with the time that you have. And I know we got some of those kind of women up in here, right? We do. In our first service, we have a lady named Linda, and she just makes blankets for people. She's a widow. She makes blankets for those that are in hospice. She was telling us a story, I think it was last Thanksgiving, as she testified that God put the Les Schwab dealership, the tire dealership, in her neighborhood on her heart because she saw it was, like, cold out or hot out. Or I don't remember what season it was. But she just had a, like, her, she was drawn that for how well they did their job and how much they've helped her and she just started bringing them cookies on the regular. She bakes little things for them, bakes some treats, and brings them and thanks them and writes cards to them. And they all call her mama, and she calls them her boys. And she just adopted the tire, the, all the guys that work in the blue-collar tire job to show them love. But who's going to have influence to share the gospel, to pray for them? She's a praying woman. Come on, what if people that had time started just not being concerned about themselves, but they started giving, Paul says, those are the kind of people you put on the registry. Because what he's saying is, if there's a woman that's, that's making a difference, she's a good example. And if she really has no family to help provide for her, then that's an appropriate time for the church to help financially, right? Yeah. Is when their family can't do that. And so there was a, apparently a, like a log or a register of those that they would take care of at a higher level when they really had the need and they, and they lived in such a, a way of character that they were, it was important to support them. So uh, honor the widows. And then he gives us a sidebar in verse 8 that an honorable believer, now this is, he says, oh, and by the way, uh, anybody who doesn't provide for their own family has denied their faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And that's kind of intense. So he kind of makes this sidebar comment like, Hey, men of God, women of God, like you got to take care of your own house. And God wants to prosper and bless us to a place where we can take care of our family's needs. 
Now, so many people that are anti-prosperity or anti-abundance teaching in the scriptures, they'll focus heavily on 1 Timothy 6, which we're going to get to next week, where we are warned about being greedy after money. We are warned not to give into a spirit of greed and, and to love money because it brings all kind of evil into our lives. But here in 1 Timothy 5, we're encouraged to prosper to the point where we can meet the needs of our own families. And so a lot of saints, I want to encourage you, Keep going to school. Get a goal. Like, get a mentor. Get a coach. Find a way to it. But God wants to bless us to be able to be a blessing to our families and take care of them when they go through different seasons. And he wants to bless us to help take care of the needs of his mission. So we've sometimes made it odds. We sometimes said, well, God doesn't want us to be greedy after riches, so he wants us all to be poor. Eh, wrong answer. First Timothy 5, he wants us to be a blessing where we can benefit our families financially. And is what happens is he wants us, he wants us to have practical feet to our faith. If we sit around and go, God will provide, and we know all the worship lyrics, and we jump up and down, and I, I, I think some more of us could get into more exuberant praise. That would actually be a good thing, right? Seriously, it's, it's wonderful to, to, to praise the Lord with all of our heart, but more than that, if we say we have this kind of faith and passion and Jesus, I trust you, and you can do anything, but we don't get off our rear and go to work, Paul's saying even unbelievers know that you're supposed to go to work and provide for your family, right? So work hard. Come on, when a man, sometimes people are like, I wish my husband was more passionate for the Lord. He reads his Bible. He goes to church. He works hard. Celebrate that man. You know what I'm saying? Like he pays, he, you know, he pays his taxes. He gives to the church. Like that's a spiritual hero, right? Somebody that puts on their boots every day and gets the job done to feed their family. That's godly. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. So watch out for things that would try to break up the family. We're, we're seeing here this picture. And then he also tells us, now be careful of the younger widows because sometimes they're not in a place where they really need your help. They're at a place where they still have opportunities in life to build families, to build marriage, to take care of their kids, to work. And make sure that the younger widows, that they don't get busy and just watching in soap operas all the time, these little gossip fables, and they're just wasting their time in all this other kind of stuff because he's, he was seeing that there was a pattern of false teaching spreading from women that were getting under this, these false fables, and they were spreading them house to house. And he's like, some of them have actually turned aside to Satan. And my manager at McDonald's used to tell me and my best friend Eric, who's also a pastor's kid, you know, uh-oh, Eric and John, you guys aren't doing anything. He goes, idle hands are the devil's workshop. <laughs> Give these guys something to do quick, right? And that's kind of the tone that Paul's using here. He's like, hey, don't, don't let some of these younger widows in your, in your church that are in your care, they're idle, and they're just chilling all the time, and they're not doing anything productive. And he's like, get, get, them, get them back to, get them, encourage them to marry, encourage them to build family, encourage them to spend their time positively, and make sure they stay away from false teaching so they don't spread this thing, and it starts to, to twist people away from the truth that's in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we're to be a place that sets up an honor code for generations. And then he starts to talk to us about an honor code for church leaders, specifically church elders. Sunrise is, is an elder-led church. I'm one of the elders, uh, and there are seven of us right now. Is that correct? <laughs> there are seven of us elders that, that lead the church. We see our pastors as an extension of our elders and our staff. Uh, and some of our elders are volunteer and do not get any payment. And some of the elders are pastors that work here and receive a salary from, from the church. And it's the non-staff elders that set, our, that set salary that help look over. The, we all look over the, the budget and the policies as a whole and the spiritual direction of the church. But it's the elders that are not paid that get to help set salary. And they follow what happens here in 1 Timothy 5, the first instruction to elders is make sure those that are elders that preach and teach the word, especially that they're worthy of double honor, which means double pay. It, and he said he uses an Old Testament scripture from the law, and he says it's just like when the scripture said, don't muzzle the ox while it treads the grain. While the ox is doing the work, let the ox eat and benefit during the time he's doing the work. And so our elders have set it up here so that the pastors and staff, we can be paid while we're doing the work of the ministry so that we can, we can 
focus on the ministry well enough that our lives can continue. And we thank God for that, right? Is that local church leadership should be provided for to the means that are available through that specific church to allow them and empower them to be able to do ministry uh, freely, to be able to raise their families and be able to, to make a difference in their cities. And we thank God for that. So that's the first way is to make sure that they're taken care of. The next thing is that he starts to say that elders are very trusted people in the church, so you have to be very careful the way you receive an accusation against an elder, right? Now, some people would bring accusations against elders because they major on the minors, and they just like, you know, that elder didn't look at me right or whatever, and you're just like, oh, well, you know, maybe they ate some weird pizza last night. I don't know. Like, it, you know, we, we're not, like, some people, they want to create, like, military tribunals every time there's like a, you know, somebody looked at me wrong or didn't give me the right parking spot. We need to have a meeting with the elders. Uh, but what Paul's talking about is when elders have violated the the role of their, the, their leadership position in the body of Christ, they are accountable because they have a lot of trust and influence, and they set the tone for the whole church. So he said there's a protocol of honor for how you bring accusations to elders. There must be two or three witnesses. Now, if two or three people know something shady is going on in an elder's life, there's probably other people that know about it too. And that can start to damage the reputation of Christ in that community. So he said they should be brought by two or three witnesses at least, and elders should be rebuked publicly, and they should be corrected, and we believe in a spirit of love and restoration. So Paul makes it very clear that when you sign up for church leadership, you get privileges. He talks about double honor. He talks about the different kind of influence that you have that is a great privilege to influence other people and lead other people for the cause of Jesus Christ. But then he shows us, as should be, when you have more privileges, you have more responsibility. And so we need to be held accountable as leaders. And, and Paul said that if you have sin in, in a way that violates integrity, if you sin with your money, if you sin with your morality, if you've broken the ethical character that is required of church leadership, you should be called on the carpet publicly and rebuked and that everybody else may fear, that everybody else may realize like, hey, we're accountable to God for the way that we live. Now, this is very rarely followed in the American church. And I want to honor my dad publicly because he has done the difficult, tricky work of honoring this passage of Scripture. A lot of times we hear in churches when elders or pastors or leaders, if someone's an elder or a pastor or deacon here, we follow 1 Timothy chapter 5. If they've, It's like, you know, leaders are not perfect. We're not asking all of our leaders to be sinlessly perfect as Jesus. We're all growing in grace. But we're, we need to see humility. We need to see growth in character. We need to see consistency in the walk. And if there is a shortcoming in their life, there's repentance, there's accountability. But when there is a major violation of integrity, of clear, outright sin, right, then there is a time for bringing this forward. And thankfully, we've had to do this very few times in our church history. But one of the times we publicly rebuked a leader, I was a very little boy in this church. I didn't even know that it happened. In fact, the, the man that sinned and violated his covenant of marriage became friends, was friends with my parents. And they moved across the state after this happened. And my parents stayed friends with them the whole time. I used to go spend the night at their house all the time. And I never knew. It blew me away when I found out that he had sinned in this way. And that my dad had publicly brought him in front of the members and regular attenders of the church and had him ask for forgiveness and confess, not in gory details to humiliate him and rub his face in it, but to stand up and say, as a leader uh, in this church, I violated the responsibility that I had and I repent and I ask for your forgiveness and it gave the church an opportunity to forgive. And you know what? I thought, how amazing is that? That not only did they follow that, but my dad demonstrated, I believe, the heart of Christ to say, we're going to stay friends with these guys and we're going to walk with them and love them. And I'm telling you, we grew up like best friends with their kid uh, th through our whole lives and, and still have a relationship with them to this day. And he testifies that even though he was brought up publicly, that what my dad did, the way he handled that by confronting it, but doing it in a spirit of love to restore, is that he said, your dad saved our marriage because of the way that he handled that. I'm not going to go into details, but I have friends that have failed, and then they even told me another story. 
failed morally and got removed from their church that, oh, they're needed in the family business or this new opportunity came up. And sometimes elders or staff members or pastors really do have a new season in life and there's nothing, there's not something always shady going on, right? Sometimes somebody gets a new job. Somebody times people do move on. But our habit in the body of Christ is, well, we don't want the name of Christ to be, you know, uh, blasphemed or shamed. We, we don't want the church to be discouraged that a leader was doing that. So we'll just, let's just sugarcoat the story so that it doesn't look bad. But what happens is if we deal, we're instructed by the scriptures that we handle things publicly. Now, publicly doesn't mean these trials and where you have people yell and accuse and you mock people and you, you know, no, 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 no. It's to bring healing to the body of Christ and it's to bring healing to the person. And churches and friends of mine that have fallen morally have said they wish that at first they thought it was good that the church decided not to tell their story publicly, but after they walked it out, they realized there was hurt and bitterness because they never got to own up to what they did wrong, and they never got to ask people directly for forgiveness. And all these gossip stories started to spin around because the truth was never shared to the light. So these are sobering things. It's not always things I like to hear like, oh, man, I could get called on the carpet. But it's good for me. It's good for us to know that there is a protocol of accountability for church leaders. Now, if you come to us and you're struggling with pornography, you're struggling with unforgiveness or anger, you're struggling with a, a, a sordid family history, we're not going to come up and blast your issues or come and tell you to repent to the whole church. This is for people that have signed up to be a pastor, to be an elder, to be a deacon, to be a leader in the body of Christ. And it's used very sparingly for extreme situations, but it is used nonetheless that it might bring, bring restoration and health. And our heart here is if a leader has fallen, we've restored many fallen leaders that unfortunately couldn't be restored in other churches. We've restored leaders in our own house that have, have been fallen in some ways. And our heart is to restore people first to their relationship with Jesus and their family. And where it's possible, we would love to see people restored to their, even their same position of leadership. Sometimes it's not possible by extenuating circumstances, but as much as we can, that would be our heart to do so. And then he, he said, Timothy... Bro, quit drinking water only. Take some wine for you. Well, he's talking about all this church leadership. Because dealing with the failure of your leaders is one of the most stressful things. So I think he's just realizing, Timothy, you're under a lot of stress as a young leader. Don't drink water only. Drink some wine for your stomach's sake. Now, this is not a proof text for you to get blitzed every night and be like, hey, I'm just like Timothy. Woo, I'm a sipping saint. You know, like, no, 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 no. Right? It's some of the false teaching that was going on during that day was saying, hey, you know what? You can't uh, you can't participate in anything pleasurable from the world. And so it could be that Timothy was like, OK, I'll just start drinking water all the time because I don't want the guys that are like anti drinking, anti meat to like get upset with me. Uh, I'll just kind of try to keep it cool and keep everybody happy. And. Paul is saying, dude, you're under stress. You need something for your stomach. And the, the distillation process for wine would be helpful for you. It would be medicinal for you. I want you to do something f physically for your body that helps you as a leader mentally and, uh, and emotionally. And he says, lastly, that, you know, be careful who you lay in this little area. Be careful who you lay hands on. It has to do with leadership. It doesn't mean that if you pray for somebody on the street and you find out later that they were a witch, that all of their heebie-jeebies jumped on top of you. All their demons came on to you. It doesn't mean, like, if you think that in the New Testament, Jesus could touch a leper and they're clean. Jesus could touch the demonized and they're clean. If you're following Christ, you have Christ in you. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. I'm not saying to be ignorant of warfare or curses or witchcraft or any of that stuff, but sometimes we've given that stuff so much more power as Christians. <gasps> oh, just pray for me. I was over and I prayed for somebody and I shouldn't have held their hand while I prayed. I found out they, you know, used a Ouija board when they were 14 and I think all their spirits jumped on me. It's like, oh my goodness. Hopefully your spirit, the Holy, full of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit jumped on them. What Paul's, what Paul's talking about is don't, Lay hands on people to set them in as elders if you know that they're living a sinful and compromised lifestyle. Make sure you know their character first because you don't want to share in their sins. If they're doing all this shady stuff and you kind of turn a blind eye to it and then they get exposed later on, it's going to look bad for you because you, in a sense, shared in their sins by endorsing them before you really knew it was time to endorse them and set them in place. So 
there's honor for church leaders, and church leaders are to carry themselves honorably in this family of families. An honor code for generations, an honor code for church leaders, and then an honor code for slave masters? What? What is this? What is this? And it is almost impossible for us to read about slavery as Americans without thinking of the transatlantic slave trade and the dark spot on American history. And so we, we have something to deal with today that may have, they probably wouldn't have had to have this conversation at all when Paul wrote this letter because he was dealing with a household thing and there was estimated maybe up to 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire at this time. So when you're talking to a family about like fathers do this, mothers do this, treat older people like this, treat the church people like this because the church is met in homes, it was household code. Honor code for the house. Teach, hey, the slaves that are in the house, like treat them like, it was just part of the household code. So we have to do some deeper work today that I'm going to ask that God just continues to do in my heart and in all of our hearts. As we look at what the Bible teaches on slavery, we'd start to get some better understanding. We, we all have had questions probably like, why doesn't Paul just flat out condemn slavery at this point? Why doesn't God clearly seem to just call slavery the evil that it is? Does the Bible endorse slavery? Sometimes it seems like it does, or it's at least silence and it's rejection, or it's implied that slavery isn't good, but it's not outright condemned. Like, what's wrong with the Bible? And if you're on a university campus, you're on a high school campus, if you're in any of the cultural conversation that's happening, uh, this is one of the main accusations from the new atheists and some of the leading intellectual scientists of our day. They're saying, like, you believe the Bible? Like, the Bible endorses slavery. So obviously the Bible's outdated. It's antiquated. It's not relevant. It's wrong. You know, we're, we've evolved morally beyond the times of the Bible. How can you even listen to anything in that book? Or you don't believe in gay marriage? Well, you don't believe in slavery, do you? The Bible endorses that. So it's really used as kind of a trump card right now to get people to just, like, discount the Bible or shame you for believing the Bible. And it's been greatly misunderstood in multiple ways. It's been greatly misunderstood culturally, and it's been greatly misunderstood by us historically that empowered the evil of slavery because, sadly, many churches and theologians and preachers endorse slavery, twisting the scriptures to their own selfish ends. And we've got a lot of repenting and healing to do as a people as a result of these misunderstandings. So, First of all, what is the slavery that Paul's talking about here? Well, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul's echoing the law of God. We talked about this at the beginning of our series. And in 1 Timothy 1, he says, what is anti-gospel? What is for broken, sinful people? We need the law. We need the law. And he condemns something called kidnapping, but in the Greek language, it's literally called man-stealing. And in 1 Timothy 1, he says, man-stealing is a violation of God's law. And so... Echoing the law of God in Exodus 21, 16, God said any person that steals somebody else and sells them into slavery is guilty of the death and is under the penalty of the death penalty for, for stealing somebody. Now, under Exodus 21 and 1 Timothy 1, we see that God clearly condemns everything that happened in the transatlantic slave trade in American and British history. That was evil. That was a violation of God's law. People that stole somebody from Africa, put them on ships, and brought them all the way to America under the Jewish law would have been guilty of death for doing so. In fact, British and American common law actually outlawed that kind of slavery for... Uh, but the tobacco industry was growing so much that greedy tobacco growers had to find a way to get cheaper and cheaper labor. And there was actually a lot of white people that were slaves at the very beginning of slavery as well, but it started to get twisted into a very racially motivated type of slavery. But Old and New Testament slavery would not have been primarily racial. It, it wouldn't have been black and white. It wouldn't have been just this culture versus that culture. Biblical slavery, again, it's so hard to us to unshackle ourselves from the, all the baggage of that word. But it was more indentured servitude for economic reasons. So we look at the Bible and go, it's so outdated. Why didn't God say this? Well, if there's millions of slaves in the Roman Empire, what's Paul supposed to say to all of them? Like, go start an armed rebellion and overthrow the Roman government? This whole system's, what's he supposed to say? He, you know, and 
I think if we look at the bigger story of Scripture, we see that even in the, one of the foundational books of the whole Bible, the, the Torah, the first five books that the law is built on, Exodus is all about God delivering his children from slavery and oppression. So Jesus' ministry, he shows up in Luke 4 and fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to set the captives free, to set slaves free. It's a ministry of freedom. And Paul would start to teach in such a way that the ideas of equality among slave and servant, or uh, slave and master, the ideas of equality between men and women, the ideas of equality between people of different races and different backgrounds, whether you're Jew or Gentile or from different cultures or subcultures, the equality, he was setting the groundwork for something that would undo the slavery and the oppression that we would live in and think is a normal part of life. But Roman slavery and, biblical, and, and even Jewish slavery under the law was, it was an economic setup to help people that were impoverished or were struggling. At times, slavery was attached to issues like prisoners of war, but also it was, in a, the most sense, it was tied to economic need. So if you were a single person or a widow and you didn't have a family, you didn't have a tri the part of the tribe to belong to, and you needed a job, you couldn't feed yourself, there was no police. There was no welfare. There was nowhere for you to be taken care of. So you would go, hey, this looks like a good house. This seems like a good man. This seems like a good family. Can I be your slave? And you would sign up to be a slave for a seven-year period. On the sixth, the, after the sixth year was your year of freedom. You had to be set free. And there were stipulations in the law that in biblical slavery, you were given livestock or land. You were given a leg up in life by serving somebody else for that seven-year period. So you see, slavery was attached to a, a personal financial benefit that you were under a contract for an X amount of years. And after you fulfilled your contract, you were given an opportunity to be an entrepreneur, to have your own land, to start something else. So there was a benefit. In fact, some slaves had it so good in the Bible that God said, hey, and by the way, if you have it so good as a slave, you can, after on your seventh year, you can pierce your ear to the door of your master and say, I make a covenant that I want to stay here because I have it so good. So it was not the same as somebody owning somebody, whipping them, beating them, and owning them perpetually with no chance of release, owning all of their children and all of their property. It's not the same thing. So when Paul writes to Timothy, it's not necessarily an expose on all of God's social agenda for upending evil. He's just trying to help. If there are slaves in the house, he's telling them, guys, work to your master is under the Lord. For he says, for the sake of the work of the Lord, that the name of God isn't blasphemed. He's trying to say, let's keep the gospel advancing. Paul always has a gospel focus when he's writing in his letters, in your marriage, in your home, in your family, in the church honor. He's telling the servants, hey, guys, listen up. Make sure that you honor your masters well so the name of Christ isn't blasphemed. If they're going to tie Christianity to, like, an armed rebellion, then it might not have the same influence. It doesn't mean that God's like, oh, yeah, I'm endorsing people owning somebody else and shipping them across the world. That's not even what biblical slavery was about. So there are economic and cultural factors that we often project from our own understanding of our American history or our current culture, and we subject the Bible to those same rules when it's not under the same circumstances and conditions. So it's very easy to make judgments against God and to make judgments against the scriptures without being educated on what the Bible's really talking about. Now, however, just because the Bible is not endorsing American slavery doesn't mean that it hasn't created a whole boatload of problems that we're still dealing with today. One thing we can glean from this, though, is Paul is making a statement of equality. In verse 2, he tells the slave that you, or the servant that you can benefit your master. And that word in the Greek has to do with being a benefactor. And that word benefactor, it mainly had to do with a richer person helping a less advantaged person in life. And Paul's telling the slave, you can actually benefit your master. He's bringing a statement of equality and saying, it's not just that you're a rich master that could benefit you and benefit society. You have something to provide of a benefit to them now because you have Christ. And he starts to make a statement of empowering people that are at the bottom that they can actually add value and benefit those at the top. So we learn that in our own jobs, we can benefit 
our employers. We should work as under the Lord. We should have a good attitude. It doesn't mean that every employer is treating us right or that God wants us to stay in the same job we're in the rest of our life and that we're locked into that just because if I wrote a letter and say, hey, as long as you work for that person, do it as under the Lord and treat them well. I'm like, well, they're mistreating me and they're not. Well, maybe you should get another job. Maybe you should pray for deliverance. It doesn't mean God wants you in that job the rest of your life, but while you're stuck in that position for as long as you are, Treat him respectfully and honorably. It's not an empowering of the institution if you're in a bad work environment. It's just saying the only thing you can do in your life is be responsible for yourself and your attitude and how you show up. So we can carry that today into our own jobs or into our own assignments. So next we see that there is a misuse of scriptures uh, that has happened and that still we are, we're affected by history of American history. We're affected by the continual practice of the slave trade today that a lot of people are still ignorant of that's happening all around us in our nation, in our world, in our cities. And there is an issue of racism that we're going to talk about too that is still in the aftermath of what's happened in our, our misunderstanding of biblical slavery. So in modern slavery today, we have people being trafficked for labor, being sold as slaves for labor and for sex all over the world, in our own ports, in our own cities, in our own communities, people are being trafficked and children are being trafficked as sex slaves and it's heartbreaking. We've been seeing a lot of exposure. Oh, well, we've been seeing some, I wouldn't say a lot, but there has been some exposure in the mainstream media, even with Hollywood stars, political leaders that are getting busted for uh, child sex trafficking. And these kind of things are obviously evil and heartbreaking. And the church needs to be praying for justice and mercy. We need to be praying for the freedom for our children. We need to be praying for people that are sold as labor slaves and sex slaves and this kind of evil that's happening. And we need people that will stand up against it. We need good law enforcement and good policy and people that will investigate and turn these kind of evil over. Because we think that we're so advanced in 2019, but yet globally there's still millions of people being sold and subjected to slavery. Basically, when we do things like legalize prostitution in certain areas, we found in the U.S. and abroad that you allow human traffickers to run unchecked in those places. And they think, oh, we're going to make it uh, legal so that women are, are safer. No, they're not safer. They're less scrutinized. Criminal networks are less scrutinized when their financial means are not illegal anymore. They get to run unchecked. And we as a church, well, the biggest thing I think we can do is get rid of the pornography and go into the massage parlors where people are often trafficked and repent for our own sin and say, Jesus, help us and set us free. Because all these kind of things that support organized crime and the devaluing of people, they all feed into each other. And we got to tear away from that stuff. It's evil and satanic. As is the American slave trade, it was evil and satanic malevolent, I don't know how else to say it, to condemn it enough, what, what we did to people motivated by race and then using the Bible as a cover-up has still caused untold pain and hurt in our culture and is not easily erased. You see, things are so complicated because I really believe that things like our border, in the, of our, the Mexican-U.S. border, creating order and a wall, and, pe and I, I really believe a lot of, if children are trafficked sexually internationally, where do they probably get trafficked the most? It's, well, it could be through like shipping containers, but it could also be through porous borders. And so having good law and order is, I think, necessary to protect innocent people. But we also, and in our current administration, whether you love, like, hate, whatever, our President Trump, our current administration, they've actually have had some of the biggest breakthrough of any governing administration against human trafficking. It, it, it's just, it, it hasn't gotten a lot of press or a lot of coverage, but a lot of children have been saved from sex trafficking because of a result of the coordinated efforts of our law enforcement and our current administration. However, when you start to do history, re when you start to read history, as I've been been doing a lot more. It's challenging. It's uncomfortable. But when people that are black or brown or from Central or Latin America hear a lot of the language of the white evangelical church of like, build the wall, keep the rapists out, keep the abusers out, keep the criminals out. Guess what the white church in the South was saying as soon as segregation was brought down? Increase the police force because of all these black guys are going to come rape our white girls. 
We need things like the KKK. We've got church leaders that are supporting and recruiting for the KKK because the police aren't going to be able to handle all these black criminals. We're going to need a special militia to keep them in line. So what do you think a lot of black or brown people hear when they hear, keep all the brown people out of our country, build a wall, build a wall? I wish Christians were as zealous about preach the gospel, preach the gospel, love your neighbor, heal the brokenness, heal the divide, adopt somebody. See, so issues are very complicated and multi-layered, and it's very hard to discern who's always got the, the monopoly on the truth and the best way for us. But as I started to read about black history, it's heartbreaking to think about not that long ago. You know, you still probably have people in this church that have relatives that knew somebody or somebody in their own family that was lynched or was the, the result of corrupt police brutality. I didn't say police, right? Corrupt police, which just like we don't, pastors don't like other corrupt pastors teaching falsehoods in their city, saying you're against corrupt police and unlawful killings, even if they're not the majority of killings by officers doesn't mean that you're against police, right? We need good police. Thank God for police, right? But thank God for justice when somebody's killed over racial motivation. It's wrong and it's sinful. But you start to do studies on what's happened in American history as a result of oftentimes pastors and leaders endorsing things, like I said, like the Ku Klux Klan in our history, pastors and leaders owning slaves through our history and justifying it from the Bible, that we not only turned a blind eye to it, but we perpetuated the problem. And we continue to perpetuate the problem of racism by saying that we should just all be over it by now. It's easy for me to say, well, I didn't ever own anybody. I didn't have anything to do with about slavery. It's not my fault. I'm so glad Jesus didn't show up in my life and say, well, you got a big mess here. It wasn't my fault. <laughs> Figure it out. <laughs> What's the biblical narrative? Who has power, who has privilege, lays down their life for people that don't deserve it. When you did nothing wrong, you go help people, and you restore the breach, and you repair the bridges that are broken, even though you didn't break it. Even if your family didn't break it, you have a Christ-like attitude and say, I see brokenness. I want to bring Christ's solution to it. So you start reading about lynching and Jim Crow and segregation, about the KKK. You read about Black Wall Street, one of the most horrific atrocities in our nation's history where the, the wealthiest black community in our nation probably at the time a lot of doctors lawyers and people in the financial sector a man was accused a black man was accused of a shady deal with a white girl and they used it as a justification to literally annihilate blocks and blocks and blocks of black people and the u.s government helped arm white people to go kill hundreds of black people that were successful and burned their houses, and it was literally relegated to a race riot. So there was no criminal charges filed after it. There's so many things. You look into redlining. You look into some of the different policies and legal things that stop black people from being able to own homes in certain neighborhoods. Or You looked at, at some of our laws that were disproportionate where a white guy could get busted for cocaine and have less prison time than a black man that got busted for crack. And thankfully, a bipartisan bill from our pr President Trump, and the de they just redid that. The, the Democrats and Republicans finally came together on something that benefited uh, some of the unjust uh, imprisonment laws. And so they, there's been a reform, there's been criminal justice reform. And I've had some uh, black and white pastors that I've seen and followed that I got to sit with in Atlanta last year that were telling us, like, God's doing something in, pr in the issues of racial justice and prison reform in our nation. And there's a couple people in the White House right now that are listening to us that are very close to the president, that we have their ear, and, and they're listening to us, and there's a difference that's being made. And there's a lot of difference that needs to be made. And so as we learn about these different things in history, as the church, we have to be very sensitive. And I think there are times where we need a, a law passed. We need, uh, we need the government to do something different. There's a space for the church to occupy that the government cannot occupy in our society. And we can be a place of healing, and we can be a place of reconciliation. 
I love that people in this church are going to bring tutor a, a school that's very multicultural and there's a lot of impoverished families and we're doing things to help turn around poverty, turn around education. And it's not all through government policy or government money. It's through us taking our influence and our life and getting to make friends with people that are of a different culture than us, crossing the street, keeping our neighborhood safer, helping somebody out financially, helping somebody out with their education, doing things to break cycles that keep us separate and keep people pushed down. See, to say that I believe that there's a problem with race, see, a, a lot of pastors that have stood up in different white evangelical circles and said there's a problem with race, people are saying, oh, you're a social justice guy now. You're a communist now. You're a socialist now. To say that you see a problem does not mean that you always agree with everybody else's solutions. And that's what happens when we play identity politics or we politicize everything. It's people in the church don't want to touch an issue because they don't want to appear like that liberal that doesn't believe the Bible. They don't want to uh, appear like like that social justice communist that thinks you should create every solution is through the government and through class warfare. See, I reject white guilt manipulation. I reject socialist communist policy, but I do believe there's a problem with race, and I want biblical justice to be restored because that's what it means to follow the gospel of Jesus Christ. <laughs> is that we repair the broken cities. We repair the waste places of many generations. We look at things that have not worked, and we might not. And just saying that doesn't work doesn't put me in league with other people that say it doesn't work. It just, it's what is my solution? I don't have all the solutions. I don't even have close to any of them yet. But I'm trying to learn, and I'm trying to grow, and I'm trying to say, God, what is your heart? And how do we bring reconciliation? How do we bring healing? How do we bring restoration? Because there's hurt and there's brokenness. There is a woman uh, that we knew on uh, Facebook, and she was a godly woman. And it's, for all intents and purposes, whether it matters or not to the story, uh, and in the context, she's, she's a pretty outspoken Republican. She's a pretty outspoken, she's, a, she's a, a black mama, and she takes care of her kids and is a godly woman, and she loves the Lord. Uh, and so she shared this story, though, and she said, you know, I, I grew up, raising these kids of mine, and one day the police had mistaken her, her sons for some suspects, her two oldest sons. And in her front yard, they drew their guns, and they were yelling at these guys, and her younger, youngest son was weeping uncontrollably uh, because she, he was so afraid at his age, and he wasn't following instructions, and it was not handled real well, and she was carrying another baby uh, at the time at this front door, and she's crying for her kids, and it was a very tense situation, and out of the grief of that, she miscarried her baby right after she saw her sons go through this ordeal, and it turned out that they were falsely identified, right? And so she shared stories saying, I love the police, I love, you know, and she's just trying to say, this has been my pain, this has been my story. And I think it's important for us to look at, especially as white Christians in America, to look at Latinos, to look at people that are of Hispanic background or from different backgrounds, look at people that are black or Asian and realize that they've been through a lot of hardships or they've had to go through things that we haven't had to go through. And so we have to come to a place of understanding. And we have to realize that there's layers of complex. A lot of times we throw out little sound bites or this would be the solution or that would be the solution, but we haven't considered what other people have walked through in their lives, in the church, in society, in government. And so we have to start realizing it might be hard for somebody that's come from a certain background to see things the same way I do, just like it's hard for me to see things the way that they see it. And we got to come together and learn from each other. And we got to start having dialogue and we start got to celebrate our uniqueness. We got to celebrate our diversity and say, thank God that we're becoming multicultural. As you've heard my dad say before, you know, when we bought our, our land over here, uh, on our, our parking lot, which we got the permit for, just if you didn't hear, we got the permit just over a week ago, um, finally, and we're th so thankful for that. Uh, but on that legal document, it, it, there was a clause that said no Asian person could ever own that land or like be on that land unless it was like in a position of servitude. And so you still see, and, and of course it's unconstitutional and it's illegal to have that kind of language in there, so it's not legally binding any longer, but those are the kinds of, we break those vows off our land. We love every culture and every nation. We need, to, we, need to be, we need to be reconcilers. We need to be those that bring people together in the name of Christ because he's who we have in common. And we need to start um, 
we need to approach things humbly, and we need to approach things with a, with a heart and a spirit to bring, to bring peace and healing. And I've gone a little longer in my message than usual, but I knew it was important to talk about, about these issues and to share that our heart is for all people to be raised up and champion in whatever God has for them in life and is to see people flourish and released into their calling and their destiny. The gospel calls us to make a difference. If we believe the gospel, because people have said, well, just preach the gospel. Just don't, don't preach about justice. Don't preach about society. Don't preach about... Well, people could have said that to Paul. Paul, just preach the gospel that you for, believe in Jesus so you go to heaven when you die. Don't tell us about family. Don't tell us about the slaves in the house. Don't tell us about marriage. Don't tell us about how to raise your kids. Don't. But see, all these things come out of a gospel-formed life cares about every area of life. And the gospel, as we look at it biblically, the gospel of the kingdom doesn't just solve my eternal problem of going to heaven when I die, although that's got to be central to everything we do, is that Jesus died for our sins. But because he died for our sins, not only do we get heaven when we die, but he wants us to have a redeemed family, a redeemed marriage. He wants our churches redeemed. He wants our communities redeemed and restored. See, there's implications even for the cosmos, even for creation, because Christ died and rose again. The Bible talks about a new heaven and a new earth. So literally everything in all of creation and everything in all of society will one day come under the full subjection of the lordship of Jesus Christ when he returns and he makes all things new. And he's asking us to join him in that, not because we're trying to get on something other than the gospel, but because we've been touched by the gospel. We start caring about every area of life. Amen? Let's stand on our feet as we close in prayer today. Jesus, we need you. And as our prayer teams come today, Lord, we realize that there's been much pain and much division in the body of Christ. There's been much pain in our nation, Lord. People seem more polarized than ever, at least in my lifetime. And yet, Lord, we believe that you are the repairer of the breach. You're the repairer of the brokenness, Lord. You're the one who sets the captive free. You're the one who opens up our eyes to truth, Lord God. And you call us to represent you. You call us to bring healing. You call us to bring restoration. You call us to carry redemption and mercy, Lord God, to carry your goodness into areas that are broken, Lord. And Lord, we pray you'd break off shame, Lord, where people were treated wrong because of their race. Lord God, where we've been, where we've been racist, where we've been prejudiced, where we've been looking down on people Lord God, or, or just thinking we're superior. Or we've had blind spots, Lord, when it comes to these sensitive, complicated issues, Lord God. We want to we want to adopt your ways and your truth, Lord God. And Lord, we don't care about what it looks like we are. Lord, we just want to be with you. We want to be joining you in the renewal of all things. We want to be at work with you, bringing restoration and your kingdom power into areas, Lord, that need your healing in your life. And Lord, I ask that you would help us, Lord, that you would help us to do the hard work of learning, Lord God, and keeping a posture of humility, Lord God, that we would see restoration and honor, Lord God, in our lives and in our culture, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we ask that you would get the glory and the honor, O oh God, for you are worthy. You have done a great work for us, and you're invited us into a great work to join you and work with you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. If you need prayer for anything, you need to give your life to Jesus today.